The Potato Paradox Imagine you have 100 kilograms of potatoes. These potatoes are 99% water by weight, meaning just 1% of their weight is actual solid potato. Now, you leave them out in the sun to dry. After some time, they lose water, and now they're only 98% water. Here's the question. How much do they weigh now? At first, you might guess they lost a little water. Maybe they now weigh 99 kilograms, or 98 kilograms. But the actual answer is shocking. They now weigh only 50 kilograms. Wait, what? How is that even possible? Let's break it down. Originally, the potatoes were 99% water. So 1% 1 of 100 kilograms was solid. That's one kilogram of actual potato. The other 99 kilograms was just water. Now, after drying the solid part, that same one kilogram hasn't changed. But now it makes up 2% of the total weight, not 1%. So if one kilogram is 2% of the new total, the total must be 50 kilograms, because one is 2% of 50. That's how a drop from 99% water to 98% water results in losing half the total weight. It feels wrong, but the math checks out. This paradox works because percentages aren't always intuitive. A change from 99% to 98% water sounds tiny, just a 1% shift. But in this case, it means a massive reduction in actual water. The potato paradox is a brilliant example of how proportions, percentages, and assumptions can lead us astray, even when the numbers are correct. The outcome can feel completely wrong, and that is the potato paradox, the twin paradox. Imagine two identical twins, Alice and Bob. Alice stays on Earth, living a normal life. Bob, on the other hand, takes off into space aboard a rocket, traveling close to the speed of light. After some time, Bob turns around and returns to Earth. Now here's where the paradox begins. From Alice's point of view, Bob was moving incredibly fast. And according to Einstein's theory of time dilation, that means time slowed down for Bob. So when he comes back, he should be younger than Alice. But from Bob's perspective, it was Earth and Alice that were moving. In his own frame of reference, he was at rest, and Alice was the one speeding away. So by that logic, shouldn't Alice be younger? Each twin sees the other twin's clock ticking more slowly. So when they finally reunite, who's actually younger? This seems like a contradiction. But here's the key. The situation isn't truly symmetrical. While Alice remained in a steady, unchanging frame of reference, Bob had to accelerate, turn around, and decelerate during his journey. That acceleration, the act of changing direction, breaks the symmetry. This subtle difference is what resolves the paradox. And the result? Bob really is younger when he returns. This isn't just theory. It's been confirmed through experiments using high-speed particles and precision atomic clocks on airplanes and satellites. The twin paradox isn't just a quirky sci-fi idea. It's a real consequence of Einstein's relativity, a reminder that time itself doesn't flow the same for everyone. And that is the twin paradox, the raven paradox. Imagine a simple scientific claim all ravens are black. At first, this sounds easy to test. If you observe a black raven, that seems to confirm the statement. Simple, right? But what about something completely unrelated, like a red apple? Here's where the paradox begins. According to logic, 
the statement, all ravens are black, is logically equivalent. To everything that is not black is not a raven. That means if you see a red apple, something that's not black and also not a raven, it technically confirms the statement. In other words, spotting a red apple supports the idea that all ravens are black. Wait, what? Does seeing a red apple actually count as evidence for a claim about ravens? That sounds absurd, but logically it holds. This is the raven paradox, introduced by philosopher Carl Gustav Hempel. It reveals a strange problem in how we define scientific evidence and confirmation. We usually think of evidence as something directly related to what we're studying. But in this case, an unrelated object, like a red apple, somehow becomes part of the equation. So how do we resolve this? 1. Rejecting equivalence. Some argue that even if two statements are logically the same, they don't function the same in practical reasoning. A red apple doesn't really tell us anything useful about ravens. 2. Thinking in probabilities. Others say the apple does provide evidence, but it's so minuscule it's basically meaningless compared to actually seeing black ravens. 3. Rethinking confirmation. Some suggest that we need a better definition of what counts as evidence. Maybe it should come only from direct observation, not logical trickery. The Raven Paradox forces us to question how scientific reasoning really works. If both a black raven and a red apple count as evidence, then what actually counts as proof? And that is the Raven Paradox. Russell's Paradox. Imagine you have a bunch of lists. Some lists include themselves and some don't. For example, a grocery list doesn't include itself. It just lists items like milk or bread. But a list of all lists? That would include itself because, well, it's a list and it contains all lists. Now, here's where things get strange. Let's create a new list. The list of all lists that do not include themselves. Seems simple. But now ask the question, should this list include itself? Let's try both options. If it does include itself, then it violates its own rule because it's only supposed to contain lists that don't include themselves. But if it does not include itself, then by definition, it should be included because it fits the rule. Either way, we hit a contradiction. No matter what, this list can't exist without breaking its own logic. At first, this might sound like a word puzzle or a quirky brain teaser. But when Bertrand Russell discovered this in 1901, it caused a major crisis in mathematics. Back then, mathematicians were trying to build all of mathematics on a solid foundation using sets, simple collections of things. But Russell's paradox revealed a fatal flaw. Some sets, just by trying to define themselves, collapse into contradiction. To solve this, mathematicians had to rebuild the foundations of math. New systems were created like type theory and axiomatic set theory to avoid sets that reference themselves in problematic ways. Russell's paradox forced a rethink of how logic and structure work at the most fundamental level. It's more than just a paradox. It's a glitch in the fabric of how we try to organize knowledge. And that is the Russell's paradox.